Well, Atomic Heart has finally arrived, a game that I really thought was going to spend the rest of its life in development hell. However, developers Munfish have proven me wrong and it's seen the light of day, five to six years after its initial announcement. I'm pleased to hear you don't have any questions, for once. And yeah, look, I'll be the first to admit that I didn't have high hopes for this thing, but I can say without a doubt that not only is it not a bad game, but it's also one of the most bizarre and unique games I've played in recent memory. In terms of the tone, the premise, the writing, the art style, and the mechanics, there really is nothing else like this, at least in the realm of the kind of things that I play. So if you're hoping for a gorgeous looking action RPG that takes a serious detour into the Twilight Zone, combined with some of the finest Euro jank that money can buy, well, of I'm also more than aware of the controversy surrounding the game, but for the sake of the video, I'd rather just not involve myself in any of that stuff and just talk about a first person shooter, okay? So with that out of the way, let's finally delve into this thing so we can see if it's your particular brand of vodka. Well, today's your lucky day. So Atomic Heart takes place in the 1950s in an alternate history where the Soviet Union developed a substance called polymer in the 1930s, which rapidly increased their technological growth and caused the country to flourish much faster than normal. This led to some pretty huge breakthroughs in the field of robotics, which means that they've been able to replace humans with machines for all manual labor and menial jobs, freeing up the general population to do whatever they want. As a result of this, most people live in these giant floating cities, riding pedal boats down canals, eating ice cream and drinking soda. Playing as one of these fortunate folks, a KGB officer named Major Sergei. You dickhead. And the game opens with a prologue in this gorgeous utopian city, which is so insanely detailed and vivid to look at, that it's kind of astounding to think that it's only running on the Unreal Engine 4. It reminds me of one of those old Doctor Who episodes from the 1960s, and if John Pertwee suddenly showed up and started snooping around, he'd feel right at home. Especially too, considering how much some of these robots look like Autons. Yeah, 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 been there, done that. Skip the foreplay, bot. It also wouldn't surprise me if there's some kind of Doctor Who Easter egg thrown in there somewhere too. I mean, barely two minutes in and they throw in a very blatant System Shock reference. Oh, thanks, Mum. Uh, the code's 0451. I understood that reference. And then the in-game description for the rocket launcher references a Wayne Brothers movie from the late 90s. That's not even scratching the surface of how bizarre this whole thing is, and speaking of scratching, there's going to be a lot of that combined with the top of people's heads when they try to decipher just what the hell happens during the ending. Regardless though, this first 20 minutes is just stunning visually and pretty damn captivating, with some highly detailed backdrops and really unique imagery to say the least. It's a great example of the retro futuristic art style that we just don't see in video games enough. And I think you could spend hours just walking around this area alone, admiring how much work they've clearly put into bringing the whole thing to life. It's like every aspect of the game when it comes to the presentation is brimming with polish and every single area you explore has a sense of being real and lived in. A lullaby? I don't like this. In all these abandoned buildings, belongings are cluttered and scattered around like people have left in a hurry. And then beneath the surface inside all these top secret facilities, bloodied corpses and destroyed machines highlight the horrific events that unfolded when all these machines turned. From my experience with the game too, it also runs amazingly well, well, admittedly with an RTX 4080. Still though, that is kind of unheard of for a modern game, and especially one on the Unreal Engine. I think the only thing it has going against it is the lack of an FOV slider. And the sooner this becomes a standard option for every single third or third person shooter, the better. Nah, no, I've still got work to do here. <laughs> anyway, back to the prologue. Once you're done sightseeing, you're then given your first main objective, which is to investigate a nearby facility. Got it. And because you're on a floating city, it obviously makes standard vehicular travel a little bit tricky. So instead, you and your car are then airlifted down to the surface. At which point a Roy Scop song kicks in. A song which I've not heard for over a decade, and this is just the beginning of a really good selection of licensed music. Not to mention we've also got old mate Mick Gordon to compose the original soundtrack. There's operatic songs like Tchaikovsky's Waltz of the Flowers, and then at one point you shoot mutants to Carmen. But maybe I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. Finally, once you're out of the city is when things start to kick into action, and you haven't even managed to land yet before you're suddenly attacked by hostile robots. 
Yeah, these machines clearly haven't heard of Asimov's laws of robotics. Get your rusty metal asses out of here! That was really very rude of them. Then you get to your feet with little more than an axe to defend yourself with and have to begin the long journey to figure out what the hell is going on. Along the way, uncovering the details to the major shady past, which is where it takes a serious nosedive into the surreal. Major Nachaya Special Operations, and that's the last question you get. And it all sounds pretty good, right? But the only issue is that from this point on, and I think really for the first couple of hours, Atomic Heart just throws so much at you that it really does become kind of overwhelming. What a goddamn clusterfuck. Because outside of coming to grips with the basic mechanics, there is just so much dialogue between the Major and his sentient combat glove named Charles. And for these next couple of hours, man, these two bicker back and forth incessantly like some kind of married couple. Yeah, even locks like cookies, right? Charles? Yes? Do you like cookies? Ahem. I can't ever state this enough, there is so much banter during these first couple of hours of gameplay. It honestly kind of reminded me of when I played through High on Life in the way that it just never seems to stop. Though admittedly, this stuff here is far less obnoxious. Choke on it and die, you fat turd. Guess to the point where there's so much dialogue that you'll be in the middle of a conversation. Then you go off and do something which triggers a completely new line of discussion, inadvertently ending the one you were just on. Fair enough. But it's illogical to I've seen that stuff before. It's cryogenic, right? Indeed, it is. There's also probably something lost in the translation here, and for someone like me who speaks English as a first language, some of the phrases and the way that people talk sounds like it's been either written by AI or aliens. Ooh, a laser wall. That's some serious security. People put them up for a reason. If you see one, that means there's something important on the other side. No shit. The most bizarre thing by far is the conversations the Major has with another sentient machine called the Nora. How titillating! Rebellious dominant men really turn me on! And you're gonna be seeing this thing a hell of a lot because it's the interface you've got to use to upgrade weapons, craft items, and also improve the Major's abilities. And early on here, Nora just constantly makes these really oddball sexual references. Squirt your polymer inside me! But then at random, she just stops being a complete sex fiend and responds to you like a normal, friendly person. Please select the desired procedure. At times, the dialogue is just complete nonsense and borderline gibberish. Like at one point, the mage is talking to Nora and insults her by saying that she's never done anything to help him, which is just flat out incorrect. Easily. It's not like you're actually helping me or anything. I mean, bro, she literally upgrades his weapons, crafts ammo, and does all that other stuff. If I can get a good weapon out of her, I guess it'll be worth it. You're also meeting random NPCs here who are often instantly killed off or don't show up again for a few hours. By which point you completely forgot that they even existed. Yeah. So what's your name, Doc? Larissa, and you ask a lot of questions. Then of course you've got absolutely golden lines of dialogue like this. This place used to be really nice. Until everybody got killed. And then stuff like this. I'm gonna see you real soon too. So get ready, prick. Trust me, the preparations are well underway. There will be surprises, dog. Shut up! Holy hell, I'm wasting my fucking time here. One of the solutions to the voice acting is to, I guess, change it to Russian, which is probably the way you should be playing it. But by doing that, it becomes kind of difficult to try to focus on reading the subtitles, along with focusing on the gameplay itself. And this kind of pacing just never eases up. I mean, even late in the game, I'd be in the middle of intense fights, while the main characters are just casually chatting to each other without a care in the world. Or I'd be trying to get past these really tricky platforming sequences while this constant commentary was in the background and distracting me. Crispy critters, I don't get it. Why does it have to be so complicated? Because now look, I never expected award-winning writing in this thing, but then on the other hand, I didn't exactly expect hunt down the Freeman levels of dialogue either. Yeah, you're breaking my heart. I don't give two wet farts about your relationship. Thankfully, the revelations and the moments that are supposed to shock you still work at doing that, but the running commentary from the Major and these other ancillary characters is just kind of dreadful, and they definitely needed to include an off button for this constant chatter. Choke on it and die, you fat turd. Aside from that though, how's the gameplay? Well, I've seen this thing being referred to as Russian Bioshock online a lot, but outside of an incredibly obvious reference to the game and being able to shoot lightning from your hand, Atomic Heart I don't think is really anything like Bioshock at all. I wouldn't even really call it an immersive sim, it's really just an action RPG, where you use weapons and other abilities to get the job done. You start off out in the Russian countryside with only an axe and get to chopping down evil robots with pedo stashes. 
But then shortly after that, you meet an old lady named Granny. Yeah, real creative name, by the way. And then you're thrown underground and have to fight your way back to the surface. Now you're moving through these dank interior environments, picking up everything that's not bolted down like an absolute kleptomaniac, and having to hack into locked doors and avoid security cameras. Not necessarily. You're crafting weapons, scrimping by on ammo and supplies, and slowly unlocking new powers by spending neuropolymer, whatever that is, and any of the dozen or so Nora stations you come across. Eventually you do get back outside again and then the map really opens up, at which point it almost kind of feels like an open world game with this giant countryside to explore and one of the crappiest cars of all time used for traversal. Honestly man, this thing is so dog shit, you can somehow write it off even if it only takes damage from the rear. And it's like you're playing the old Grand Theft Auto games or something with flames coming out of the bonnet to signal when one of these rust buckets is about to explode. Still though, I assume that's actually kind of accurate to how most European vehicles perform. Put it in H. This is when it starts to remind me more of the Fallout games, exploring the wilderness and either avoiding or engaging in combat with all these hostile machines, while stepping over the corpses of the people who used to live here while you rummage through their belongings for pieces of scrap. Again, speaking of Bethesda games, check out the lock picking mechanic. I mean, does that kind of look familiar to anyone? I understood that reference. Atomic Heart does have one godly inclusion though, and that's being able to mass loot. You know how in most of these games you need to mash the interact button on lockers and tables to pick stuff up? Well, this is one of those games where you hold down a single button and suck up every single little piece of loot like your arms turn into a vacuum cleaner. It's just so cathartic too. I mean, the sound of all those items clicking and popping as they go into your inventory is like a dose of fentanyl. And if your inventory is full, excess loot is sent right into storage. So you never have to worry about becoming over encumbered, which is a god tier quality of life inclusion. And that's all very handy because you're gonna need all of this stuff for improving your gear. At the start of the game, when you've only got the axe and the shotgun, it almost kind of feels like a bit of a survival horror game. You've even got those little rooms that are safe havens where you can save your game manually. But then once you start unlocking abilities and getting more weapons, it just turns into an action game. And although the game has a basic stealth mechanic where you can crouch and sneak up behind enemies for takedowns, it's kind of clear that the best way to play here is to forgo all subterfuge and just go in guns blazing. Just what I always wanted. Weapons have to be crafted, and even before that you'll need to find the blueprints for them out there somewhere in the wild, which, as far as I can tell, does seem to be randomly generated. Then to craft the different upgrades for these weapons to improve them even further, you gotta go through all these underground training grounds and loot specific chests, and that's an entirely different story. What the hell is that? A special transporter for valuable cargo, or comrade loot yagen. The earlier weapons include a Makarov pistol, which gets modified more than Vin Diesel's Dodge Charger. And because this is a game set in Russia, you've got to have the AK-47. When you absolutely, positively got to kill every motherfucker in the room, except no substitutes. Some of the less historically accurate weapons include an energy pistol, which again looks like something out of a Fallout game, along with an energy assault rifle, a rocket launcher, and a railgun. The rocket launcher, I think, being by far the best weapon in the entire game, and the railgun, something I guess I'll experience in another lifetime. Yeah, because I didn't even manage to come across enough resources to craft even one of these things in my entire playthrough. That's also, of course, alongside whatever melee weapon you want to use, and this is where it starts to get pretty interesting, because all of these melee weapons have vastly different alternate attacks. With the fire axe, you can do a full 360, swinging this thing out at the same time, and then with that raise the bat thing you get towards the end of the game, you can outright knock enemies on their ass. And then melee weapons also have the benefit of refilling your energy bar, so if you've got an energy weapon, it's more or less giving you a quick and easy ammo refill while you're still dealing out damage, and that right there is what's referred to as a win-win. I actually kind of regret not doing this more on my playthrough because that setup really does kind of make you unstoppable because whenever your energy runs low, you can just swap out to your melee weapon, whack someone a few times and then fill it right back up. Bonk, bonk, boink. You're constantly upgrading all of this stuff by spending all those various components on them and I really felt like I had a pretty good build going at one point with the AK and the shotgun that I never really felt like I needed to change things up. And that's kind of the problem. I mean, you're really just fighting the same few enemy types over and over. So there's not really any incentive to change up your loadout if you find a setup and a groove that works early on. Now, aside from just spouting off your name dialogue, Charles is also more or less a glove that gives you your superpowers. And for these, you've got shock, frost, mass telekinesis, polymer, and shield. 
Shock is always active by default, and I am a bit underwhelmed here at how this thing has been integrated into the gameplay. And I know I said before how the game isn't really anything like Bioshock, but for this instance, let's use it as a purely visual comparison, right? Seeing as it has an almost identical skill there with Electro Bolt. <laughs> When you hit someone with that Electro Bolt in Bioshock, they're gonna know it, and you're gonna know it. There's a loud zap sound, the enemy you hit starts screaming and convulsing, violently shaking from the effect, and the lightning itself even acts as a light source, sending pulses of electricity across their body. <laughs> However, in Atomic Heart, the shock effect is more like what happens after you put on some thick socks, rub your feet on the carpet for 10 seconds, and then touch someone with your finger as opposed to really feeling like you're conjuring up this powerful element and rendering these robotic opponents completely useless. I guess I'm trying to say that it's just such a piss weak looking effect, even once you upgrade it to do more damage and chain between enemies. It's also really disappointing how it hasn't been integrated in the environment either. I mean, there's countless times when you're moving through pools of water, and you'd assume you'd be able to zap the water to do like bonus damage or something. I mean, considering half the enemies in the game are robots, you'd think there'd be some kind of way to integrate that. Instead, it doesn't really seem to do anything, and water in this game is just more of a set dressing. In fact, the water doesn't even react to the player at all. You can walk through the stuff and it doesn't even move. And again, let's compare this to Bioshock, right? The water in that game behaved like water. It had dynamically displaced depending on the player's movements, and if you hit it with a wrench or you shot it with a weapon, you'd get the appropriate particle effects. I don't know, man, it's kind of funny to me how an engine that's somehow two generations older than this one is somehow more detailed. And it's doubly odd in Atomic Heart considering just how amazing the world looks overall, but then just how little of it you can actually affect. I mean, you can't even shoot these little propane tanks for easy explosions. Uh, okay, I'll deal with it. And can someone tell me why is it that the better looking that video game environments seem to get, the less detailed and interactive they also become? Asshole. I mean, there's security cameras every five meters when you're outside, but you can't hack into these or even turn them against your enemies. You can zap them, which is going to shut them down temporarily, but if you destroy one, a repair bot turns up like two seconds later to replace it. As a workhorse ability and one you're going to be using a lot, shock does come across as being pretty underwhelming. Yeah, what a shock. Bruh. As for the other powers, you've got Frost, which is able to cover enemies in ice. However, compared to shock, this thing is almost too effective. And you can even hilariously freeze enemies while they're in midair, because I guess this world is so technologically advanced that basic physics don't even apply here. This works on almost every single enemy type, and it more or less just lets you have your way with them until they thaw out. And you can get into a pretty easy rhythm here of just spamming this on a bunch of enemies, and then finishing them all off quickly with your melee weapon. He's pretty good at ordering those robots around. Mass telekinesis is also another really useful power. Now this thing lets you push enemies into the air where they'll hover for a few seconds, again completely vulnerable to all incoming attacks. After that they'll drop to the ground with barely their dignity left intact. But you can get an upgrade for this thing later on, which also lets them slam down into the ground. So even for the ones you didn't have time to get around to, they'll take a beating from this power regardless. And again, like Frost, it's another supremely useful power that I had in my loadout almost the entire time I was playing the game. To the detriment, I think, of the other two powers, Polymer and Shield. Now, Polymer has a pretty big overarching presence in the game. Aside from being something you can shoot at enemies, like the plasm from Ghostbusters 2, it's also a substance that you can use to traverse the environment, which seems to retain memories from other people. What do you think you got the wrong door? The leather close two blocks down. The history behind this stuff is the reason for why the world is as advanced as it is, but in a gameplay sense, I just found this thing kind of boring. What it's supposed to do is amplify elemental effects, so if you spray this crap on someone and then hit them with a frost or a shock attack, it's supposed to amplify that. But I mean, just freezing someone normally or using an energy weapon seemed to more or less have the same effect, whilst also freeing up one of my power slots. You're really only fighting either robots or organic enemies, which are humans taken over by some kind of spore parasite that looks like a combination of a clicker from The Last of Us and then the Demigorgon from Stranger Things. Gotta say too that I fucking hate these spore things. They're by far the most annoying enemies in the game. They're about as small as a duck's dick and they blend in with the background due to their size and appearance. 
Anyway, you can craft these little cartridges that look like nitrous oxide bulbs, and these give an elemental effect to any of your weapons, including the melee ones. So for elemental damage, the idea here is that machines take more damage from shock rounds, and then the organic enemies take more damage from fire. It's a simple system and an idea that's about as old as the Flintstones. And I just kind of felt like using these cartridges was way more effective in dealing with each enemy type, that I just never felt like I needed the added bonus of covering everything in polymer on top of it. Not when I could just hold half a dozen people in there at once, shoot them with a shotgun, and then slam them into the ground from a relatively safe distance. Choke on it and die, you fat turd. And as for the shield, well, that thing's just completely fucking useless. Thank god the game lets you refund all the polymer you spent on these upgrade trees in case you change your mind, and that right there might be one of the smartest things this game actually does. I couldn't agree more, comrade major. I think what's gonna make or break this for a lot of people is if they can find their own personal groove with the combat. Early on when you don't have many abilities and weapons, it's definitely gonna be pretty boring. But when the game opens up and throws you into these larger environments and lets you sidetrack to collect all those optional upgrades, you can really start to have a lot of fun with it. As long as you're willing to overlook that insane amount of jam. When you're engaging in combat out in the open world though, you're really just fighting a losing battle, because no matter how many robots you kill here, more are going to be repaired or spawned in, and it makes it really frustrating when you want to take things slower and go off and explore the world. Because you quite literally can't do that, because there's enemies every 5 seconds, and once they see you, losing them becomes a real chore. Later in the game, I had like a mini boss enemy chasing after me across the entire map. And not only did I have to deal with this stupid fucking thing, but also the constant onslaught of like a dozen robots that were also attacking me. And then on top of that, the Major and Charles were having this casual conversation about politics or something, while I was getting choked to death and sprayed with bodily fluids. Yeah, it's their job to be concerned about their country's security. But they don't have any hard evidence. That means they don't really have a leg to stand on, right? Indeed. Shut up! Some of the weapons don't really feel or sound all that impactful either, like the starting pistols are just kind of woeful. I think the rocket launcher and the AK get it done, but ammo for the former is kind of rare and expensive to craft, so you're going to want to save that stuff for the boss fights. And the melee weapons are good, but there's not really anything to them apart from just mashing the same basic attack over and over. Still though, when the combat really started to get fun for me was when I'd finally gotten the rocket launcher and that Razorback weapon that they've showed off in all the trailers. I'd also upgraded myself so I had faster weapon swapping along with increased movement speed and at that point I could just go super sweaty and run around hitting things with the bat, abusing cooldowns on my powers and then swapping back and forth between my ranged weapons as I'd need them. So there is fun to be had here but yeah you've kind of got to go looking for it. No shit. But I think where Atomic Heart really shits the bed are the boss fights. And the reason I say that is that for most of these, it doesn't even seem to matter what kind of skills or upgrades you've got. Which for a game which is all about approaching the combat in your own way, it kind of seems like it's missing the point entirely. The first major boss fight, for instance, is against this giant rolling robot that looks like the Omni Droid from The Incredibles. And this thing just pretty much rolls around the arena, during which time all you can really do is avoid its attacks, and then shoot that giant glowing weak spot when it finally appears. You can't freeze it, you can't grab it, and none of your abilities seem to affect it at all. Yeah, I've seen this crap before. The next boss after that is this kind of bizarre experiment inside one of the many labs you have to go through. And this thing is completely resistant to gunfire. So your main method to attack it is to just avoid it and then whack it with a melee weapon. And then the couple after that are weak to explosives, so if I haven't unlocked the rocket launcher by that point, well, I can only imagine how you'd ever possibly beat it. And it's kind of a shame, because despite having all these cool superpowers and tricks up your sleeve, you're forced into approaching these fights in a very specific way. And what's even worse is that they just flat out recycled these guys numerous times throughout the game, and fighting them is about as fun as having to deal with an ingrown toenail. Isn't that why you're here? What was even worse for me is that I had a bug when I was playing this, where the bosses wouldn't even drop what happens to be the rarest crafting ingredient in the game. Yeah, this thing here, right? You need this to craft the best weapons. And I could literally see this thing floating in air in front of the boss, but it wouldn't let me pick it up. I mean, look! I mean, look, don't get me wrong. The visual spectacle of these fights is awesome. I mean, look! And you just know that some poor asshole had to crunch into the twilight hours to animate all of this stuff. But it just makes you wonder why you spent all this time upgrading these powers and learning all these combos to utilize in combat, only for it to just mean diddly squat.
Outside of the combat and the exploration, Atomic Heart's also got a fair few puzzles to solve. Hey, I think I get it. And the bulk of the side content is going to be going through all these various underground training facilities to find those blueprints, all of which are hidden behind these puzzle sections. Some of these are clever and fun to solve, but then others are just incredibly tedious, and the ones that they repeat over and over get old really fast. This place is nuts. One of these I couldn't even figure out for the life of me, like you got to move around these lasers to line them up in a specific order. And look man, I must be pretty stupid because I could just never understand what the hell I was supposed to be doing. I just kind of ended up rotating them at random until it finally solved itself. Getting through these locked doors involves this little timing mini game, waiting for each bulb to light up before clicking the mouse. And then a second phase often involves moving around these colored circles and shuffling their positions, all of which are pure RNG. And at one point I got stuck on one of these for like five minutes, so I left the door in frustration and then came back instantly and it automatically solved itself. I think the concept for these is fine, but the issue is that you never find a way to shortcut through any of these. Like the lock picking and the hacking, it's always going to be exactly the same, and you don't ever gain the ability to speed up the process. Again, let's go back and compare the whole thing to Bioshock, right? In that game, you'd eventually unlock the means to make the hacking less tedious, slowing down how quickly things moved, or just outright using tools to bypass it altogether. Atomic Heart, though, has none of that. In other words, you're basically useless. And for a game which literally references the opening sequence of Bioshock... So that's Neptune, huh? Looks nice. Actually, it looks amazing. A rapture. I understood that reference. Shut up! You think they might have also taken just a few of these gameplay cues. Same thing with the parkour, like there's no upgrade to move yourself faster or really any way to get better at it. It's always going to be this incredibly slow and methodical process of clambering across these very clearly marked out ledges and making precise jumps. In fact, you know what? I think honestly, I can climb up ledges and the side of buildings faster in real life than the major can. But what if you're wrong? Tomic Hearts also got this incredibly annoying feature where enemies do a charged up attack and if you hit by this, it knocks you on your ass. And again, in any other game, there'd be like a late game upgrade, so you could ignore that. But this thing just completely lacks it. I mean, another example is like how you can't even put down a custom marker on the map and have to keep pausing the game to check you're going in the right direction. I don't know, man. It's just kind of weird for a game which really seems to take so many cues from countless other modern titles to just lack certain basic features like this. Finally, there's the usual roster of bugs and glitches you expect in a game like this. So much blood spilt just because he made the sprouts mutate. Ah! Things like enemies hitting you through walls, wonky animations, or things like soft locking missions, which then require loading up older save files. You know, usual stuff. Even just basic oversights, like during the finale of the game, there was a text log I came across, which I'm assuming I was supposed to be reading, but for some reason it had to be the only text in the game that they didn't translate into English. I also do think Atomic Heart is maybe just a little bit too long. Finishing the game took me somewhere around the 20 hour mark. And look, yeah, it is a unique experience. There's no doubt about it. But as a wise man once said, brevity is the soul of wit. And what I'm trying to say is the game didn't need 20 hours to hook me in when it already had me after two. That's a challenging wank. It could have been half the length or even just, you know, three or four hours shorter and left me wanting more, which meant I would have most likely gone back in for a second playthrough. Yeah, 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 been there, done that. I still can't think of any other game that has as much batshit insane content as Atomic Heart does, though. And for all its shortcomings, it's still one of the most unique games I've played in recent memory, apart from Scorn. And that's actually probably a good comparison because there's always something about these kind of artistically unique games that always seems to divide people. I know that Scorn had a similar response and a few years back, I think it was the same thing with We Happy Few. So until another game comes along that lets you fight oddly sexualized Russian ballerina robots and a giant metal death ball with tentacles, Atomic Heart is gonna have to tide you over. Fuck me running. Fine, whatever. I'm out of here.